Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Harvey White, the educator here at the Augusta Museum of History. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us for this May's Brown Bag. I know it's a little different, um, but I think that you'll still enjoy it. Um, just to note, this lecture was pre-recorded, but if you have any questions, you can e email them to me. Um, my email address is education at augustamuseum.org, or you can write them in the comments and I'll try my best to make sure they get to our speaker to answer those for you. Um, happy National Apple Pie Day. I always try to do a fun national day, so today's no difference. Um, so have a little slice of apple pie while you watch this lecture. Please continue to follow us on all of our social media platforms and head on over to our website to join our mailing list if you're not on that list. Um, these are the best ways to stay up to date about upcoming programming and any changes we're making here at the museum. I'd like to thank Michael Searles, a.k.a. Cowboy Mike, for this great lecture on the transatlantic slave trade and its impact on Southern food. Cowboy Mike is a lifelong educator, and he recently retired from Augusta University. His focus is usually um, Black cowboys in the West, but this was a little different for him, so I'm so thankful that he was able to, to do this lecture for us. I hope you all enjoy and stay safe. Thank you. Many of you know me as Cowboy Mike or Professor Searles. Uh, but long before I became Cowboy Mike, I was uh, also known as Kwasi Iwalimu. Kwasi is the name for a male child born in West Africa on Sunday, and Iwalimu is a Swahili word for teacher. I have had an overriding passion for African American history which I taught for many years. I was pleased when the Augusta Museum of History asked me to make a presentation on soul survivors, the transatlantic slave trade and its impact on, on Southern foods. The slave trade had a profound impact on the food selection and preparations of what Southerners eat. The bringing out of Africans to the shore of the Americas again not only brought labor, of course, we know that slaves were brought to the Western world, to the Americas, to basically tin to, to, uh, again, tobacco, cotton, uh, sugarcane, etc. But Africans were more than a laboring force. They brought their culture and their worldview. Uh, it was reflected in the music that they made and the music uh, the impact on uh, on uh, divisions in the United States, as well as food traditions as well. Before the arrival of Europeans uh, to, on the African continent, uh, Africans had a very rich, rich food history and heritage, a uh, very varied plant life and animal practices. For example, crops like millet, sorghum, rice, plantains, okra, watermelons, African yams, cow peas, also known as black eyed peas, were all a part of that continent's diet. Once the transatlantic slave trade began and thousands of uh, Africans were brought to the coast of Africa, uh, usually to be put in slave castles or slave pens, uh, there was a, a dramatic increase for food. Again, and as under the slave ships, their, tra their trade around the, the west coast of Africa, again, uh, they're also being had an increased need on, on two different levels. Uh, the castles that were established, the so-called castles were established, were manned by, again, in many cases, Europeans. They needed to eat, and they were firmly lodged there. The slaves that were brought to those castles, again, that were going to be transported across the Atlantic, also needed food to eat. It's been estimated that 12.5 million or more Africans were taken uh, again from the continent of Africa between the 1500s and 1866. The, uh, some of the foods that were consumed uh, by the Africans and by the Af African slaves were not African in origin. For example, maize and manioc came from the Americas. But slaves preferred foods with which they were familiar, such as rice, African beans, millet, sorghum, and cow peas. Yams were thought, uh, 
essential. In fact, one slave captain said that, again, he felt that was a very important food to bring aboard the ship, uh, even though they took a lot of slaves, very bulky, uh, because it, it, it comforted the slaves and made them, again, uh, again, uh, again and helped them to make that ad ad adaption. In fact, some of the foods that were brought on board that were not African uh, were hard for the slaves to digest and hard for them to basically, uh, and quite often, they got sick and didn't do well. After provisioning uh, the slave ships, it was uh, important to acquire the food necessary. There's some interesting stories that say that sometimes slaves were easier to acquire and took in a faster time than it was the foods that had to go aboard the ship. Remember, this is going to be about, uh, could be a three month voyage, and everybody on that ship had to eat. Now, many ships had ship, slave, uh, had ship cooks, uh, some did not. But in many cases, uh, it was important to bring on folks, again, who could prepare the food that was going to be eaten on the voyage. Now, this was often women. There was sometimes thought to be a balance between men and women on the ship, a, a good balance, uh, again, in terms of what it required. But again, quite often, African women were the ones that were needed. Uh, in some cases, for example, when rice was purchased, uh, it was unmilled and unclean. It had to be cleaned and milled, and that was often done by African women, as well as sometimes the grilling of millet and corn. When slave ships arrived in the Americas, they often brought seeds and tubers, uh, again, part of the diet, but it's interesting too that some were preserved in watertight gourds uh, and again made that trip. Now there are stories uh, uh, in, embedded in folklore uh, of the low country of South Carolina and Georgia that when slaves arrived in those regions, they carried in their hands these little sesame seeds, uh, sesame seeds known by the African name bene or bene seeds. Uh, it's interesting too that those seeds are still being grown there and produce wafers and cookies. Uh, for example, there's a company in Charleston called the Old Colony Bakery in Charleston, South Carolina. It still bakes and sells many wafers and advertises itself as the home of the original Charleston Benny Wafer. There are also, also interesting stories about how seeds were smuggled in or brought in by slaves. In Brazil, there are stories that African mothers would put a, 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 a grains of, of, of uh, rice in the hair of their children when they're being sold. Uh, and the idea, again, being that this would provide them with food. Now, I don't know if this was metaphorical or the idea that somehow they would be able to do that, but they put that in their hair, again, with the idea that it would provide them with food to eat. While African foods influenced the cuisine of all parts of the American colony, it is the South that received the bounty of African-American cooking. On some plantations, slaves, once they completed their field work, were allowed to grow gardens. Now, sometimes this was at nighttime. In other words, after they worked all day, they went into their gardens at night. Uh, and then they grew vegetables, such as okra, chili peppers, eggplants, watermelons, cabbage, tomatoes, white potatoes, squashes, squash, and, and greens. Now, much of the information we have about slaves and the kind of preparation foods that they, they ate and they prepared comes from the Works Progress Administration uh, during the, uh, again, the Depression uh, when the uh, various agencies were established under FDR. Uh, the WPA sent out individuals who collected stories, stories from ex-slaves about what, they, what their lives were like, what they ate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and one of the things uh, that was often said was that slaves often did not get enough food to eat. That was a common complaint. Now, there's a story, interesting story, maybe apocryphal, that was told that uh, I read at some point in time. Said that during hog killing time, again, uh, it was the process, it was the, mainly the practice of, again, having a large slave go in and, and kill, the slit, kill the hogs. Uh, and then, of course, the best part of the meat uh, again, was passed on to the master, the rest was given to slaves. Well, the story goes that one night, again, uh, the hogs all mysteriously died. 
And the next day, the slaves are standing around the, the, the hog pen, very mournful, tearful. When the master came out and saw them, he said, well, what's going on? What's happened? What happened to these hogs? And the slave said, now light us. And looked as if they didn't want to have anything to do with those hogs because they died of malitis. Well, the master didn't want to eat any, any hogs that had died of malitis. and said, well, y'all take all the hogs. And of course, the story goes that how the hogs got malitis was that a slave, large slaves, went into the pen that night and hit the slaves in the head with a mallet, creating malitis. Well, that's, again, one of the stories that comes out of, again, the uh, African, uh, African-American experience around food and, and some of the sort of common aspects of what, in fact, sometimes happens. A food closely identified with Southern cuisine is barbecue. While the practice may have originated in, West, in the West Indies, by the 19th century, the culinary techniques were well established in the American South. And because pigs were prevalent in the region, pork became a primary meat for barbecue. Now in the West, of course, it was beef, but in the South, it was hogs, it was pigs, pork. Barbecue had an additional benefit. It could be prepared in, large, in, in such a large quantity in order to feed a lot of people. Enslaved people were a driving force between, behind the art of barbecue uh, and preparing both the smoke and salts for, again, its application. On plantation, slaves prepared and cooked the majority of meat for the planter's table. Slaves ready meat for the smokehouse, from slaughtering and butchering the animals, salting the meat, hanging the dried meat in smokehouses, carefully keeping a low burning fire under the meat for weeks, and then storing uh, the smoked meat. Because of the time and labor involved in this preparation, Barbecue had to be cooked over a long period of time. There were rituals in the black community to cook uh, a split hog throughout the night, flipping the hog after it had been cooked on one side. I had the experience some years ago of, uh, in, I was not the person in charge, but I assisted Nebraska Robinson, my neighbor. He was going to barbecue a hog, uh, and I forget who it was going to be for, but he was going to do that. And he asked me if I could help him. So we stayed up all night, laughing and talking, the rest of watching the fire, putting the wood in, uh, spreading it out in such a way to, to burn ashes to the meat. And at a critical time, it was time to flip the hog. You had to cross your arms, grab the legs of the hog, and flip it over so they could cook on the other side. It was an arduous task. Uh, but the meat was absolutely delicious. Another food that African Americans placed their stamp of, uh, was cornbread, on the stamp was cornbread. While Native Americans introduced corn, uh, again, to the European arrivals, corn, an adaptable crop for the South, was widely consumed by both free and enslaved peoples. Slaves were particularly well, reliant on corn and was the most common ration for enslaved people in the South. The making of cornbread was practiced by Native Americans and slaves adopted the practices uh, in the making of whole cakes, ash cakes, spoon bread, corn pong, and cornbread. Slave cooks, preparation of cornbread became a staple for Southern cooks and households. Cornbread actually became synonymous with the South and a staple in Southern cookies uh, and, and meals. Another food with a regional audience was greens. During slavery days, uh, in uh, slavery days, women would forage for greens uh, again in the woods. Uh, and with, this would include dandelion greens, beet tops, well, turnip greens, watercress, and wild weeds. I have an experience when I was in my hometown of Edisville, Illinois, going out with my aunts and some of the other ladies of the, of the community. When I was younger, I was in the woods, but we lived about maybe five miles or so outside of the outside of Edison the Woods. And they went through and they picked up, they uh, uh, picked get land, land, land greens. So I saw it in, as a real practice. Uh, again, slaves, again, would uh, make meals of the, uh, the, the greens by gathering them and cooking them. And of course, college was a favorite 
uh, of kale and tops of beets, turnip, and again, wild weeds. Greens today are often flavored with hot peppers, pork, and other spices, inspired by the boiled vegetables and one-pot meals common to West African cuisine. Slaves prepared a dish that extremely familiar, similar to modern greens, but with much more diverse repertoire of vegetables. While greens have a long history in the world, the southern style of cooking of greens came with an arrival of the African slave to the southern colonies, and the need to satisfy their hunger and provide food for their families. Just as cornbread found a permanent home, greens, especially collard greens, have become a staple in southern cooking. Uh, foods originally uh, suitable for slaves are now celebrated in southern heritage. Uh, and what I did is, I went to the grocery store today, and on the shelves, you can see, you can buy a can of glory food, seasoned southern style, again, collard greens. This is, again, it just kind of shows in a sense how broad and how widespread now Again, things at one time were consumed by slaves and then by Southerners in general, and now become again a staple in a lot of households. Uh, something that you would, I'm sure that if you'd ask a, if you had asked a slave about that years ago, they would have said that was unimaginable. Another vegetable that can be added to the pantheon of foods that have an African American connection is the sweet potato. Sweet potatoes are an American Indian contribution that Africans adopted and transformed. African yams grow bigger and uh, grow bigger than sweet potatoes and are eaten boiled, fried, or roasted. While starchier and drier than sweet potatoes, with the arrival of African slaves in America, sweet potatoes made a suitable substitute for yams. In times, even the name sweet potatoes and yams became uh, interchangeable. Uh, another, again, trip to the grocery store, and it says, this, this is Bruce's yams. But underneath it, it says, cut sweet potatoes in syrup. Well, yams and sweet potatoes are not the same, but the term yams that we have become so interchangeable that this particular producer can call his product yams, but under it, a little notation, cut sweet potatoes in syrup. So again, it's become such a common factor to uh, exchange those words that uh, sometimes people think they're the same. Slaves often grew potatoes in their garden, sweet potatoes in their garden, uh, utilizing skills that African Americans passed down from generation to generation. Today we enjoy sweet potatoes with a lot of extra sweetness. We drizzle them with butter, sugar, cinnamon, toasted marshmallows, or just go ahead and turn them into, uh, again, pie corn. The sweet potato, however, was originally flavored with a more simple, uh, as a more simple, more wholesome vegetable. Another entry in southern pantheon of foods, cook, uh, foods, cook, food cookbook, is okra. A native of Ethiopia, okra is one of the many food staples that travels the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to the Americas and is one of the most prominent foods associated with the influence of African culture in the New World. Even the word okra is derived from a Hebrew word for a vegetable called okru. Following the forced relocation of enslaved people, okra spread to North America from the Caribbean in the 1700s. In West Africa, okra was often used as a thickening uh, agent for soups and one-pot meals and many slaves grew okra in their gardens. In the South, it is often fried, stewed, or used in a gumbo, and even sometimes pickled. While okra can be prepared and endless, uh, uh, prepared, or, or in, while the ways okra can be prepared are endless, uh, it has been distinctive, uh, it, but it has a distinctive African origin and an African American contribution to Southern cooking. The place African and Native American foods and their preparation by African Americans cooks shape the South and its identity. Judy Parker Yeager, whose passion for Southern cooking prompted her to share Southern recipes with a community of people who truly enjoy cooking, ex 
express it this way, and these are the words of Harper. Southerners have a strong sense of regional heritage. We are proud of our turnip greens, cornbread, sweet tea, rural past, and southern draws. We are card-carrying Southerners proud to be from the South, where we drink sweet tea by the gallon, bake cornbread by the pony, eat collard greens and grits, love family, house, and home, pick a nest of uh, beans, and fry a mess of fish. Love some good old barbecue served upon a dish. Summer weather, humid and hot, with days that are long. We love the laid back southern ways and keeping tradition strong. Those were her words of expressing the sense what it meant to be a southerner. Yet laced in that description were the foods that were being originally brought either from Africa or are being shaped by African American cooks. African American cooks who historically spent their lives in the shadows have entered into the spotlight. For example, Edna Lewis wrote a book called The Taste of Country Cooking. The late Edna Lewis was born in 1916 in Virginia in a community established by African Americans, some of whom were former slaves. Uh, after, she returned, after she traveled to the North, she returned to Atlanta and published the book, The Taste of Country Cooking, which quickly became a classic. In her book, she expertly interweaves stories of her childhood in the country with recipes that still have deep significance within the black community. Another African-American cook uh, in the back of a uh, chef wrote a book called Soul, a chef's culinary evolution in 150 recipes. Uh, Ty Richards wrote that book. Ty Richards, an Atlanta-based chef with popular restaurants such as Richards, Southern Fried in Crog Street, Crog Street Market, uh, One Two South in Atlanta, Hartsville, a Jackson International Airport, where he serves as culinary director. One book by Leah Chase called The Dookie Chase Book. Uh, Leah Chase was born to a Catholic Creole parents in the early 1920s. Ms. Chase in a, is a living legend, often referred to as the queen of Creole cuisine. Chase's New Orleans restaurant, the Duke of Chase, has been an institution for almost 80 years. The Duke of Chase cookbook gives the reader access to some of the restaurant's most iconic dishes, uh, think thick, think thick, meaty gumbos, red beans and rice, and turtle soup. Carla Hall uh, published a book called Carla Hall Soul Book, Soul Food, Every Day uh, and Celebration. Carla Hall is a former co-host of ABC's The Chew and, and a beloved Top Chef contestant. Uh, Hall has published two previous cookbooks, but her most recent efforts on soul food might be her most personal in this book, Hall invites readers into her childhood in Nashville and helps to anchor her story in the larger narrative of African Americans in the South. The effect uh, is the book uh, is that it's a full, it's full of delicious recipes and culturally significant stories. Many of us have heard of Patty LaBelle. Patty LaBelle, of course, was a uh, again an amazing singer. She still is, uh, but also more recently, author of a cookbook called LaBelle's Cuisine, Recipes to Sing About. Patty LaBelle created a viral sensation with her Patty LaBelle's sweet potato pie. Her cookbook, LaBelle's Cuisine, Recipes to Sing About, was released in 1999 and instantly shot to the top of the charts and at the hearts of African American families across the country. Now, I happen to have a partially eaten sweet potato pie made with sweet potatoes, butter, and spice by Patty LaBelle. Now, if you were here with me, I might have, I might again share some of this pie with you. However, I decided, along with my wife, to consume a couple of slices before, so it's not a complete pie. But again, this is found at Walmart. And so throughout the Walmart stores, again, once again, Southern cuisine, again, becomes a part of people's lives. Not just in the South anymore, but indeed throughout the nation. 
Tony Tipton Martin wrote a book called the Jemima, Jemima Code, Two Centuries of African American Cookbooks. Jemima Code is a unique combination of historical anthology and cookbook written by food historian Tony Tipton Martin. This book focuses on the various ways African American women have contributed to the world of cooking, while at the same time change, uh, challenging the racial stereotypes of the Aunt Jemima woman. Delph Adams wrote Grand Baby Cakes. Uh, Joycelyn Delph Adams, by the way. Joycelyn Adams is a self-taught baker whose cooks highlight her own grandmother's famous recipes, as well as some of her own. Adams' grandmother's recipe lived on in this regularly, highly accessible book full of time-treasured recipes. Many of us would know the name of Robbie Montgomery, um, not so much maybe because of her cookbook, because, again, of her fame as a television star. She wrote a book called Sweetie Pie's Cookbook, Soulful Southern Recipes, uh, From My Family to Yours. Robbie Montgomery, the owner of the a very uh, popular bakery, Sweetie Pie's, and the star of a reality show of the same name, Mrs. Montgomery, the oldest of nine children, was born and raised in Miss Mississippi where she learned to cook from her mother's side. In her book, Montgomery takes her readers through some of the most beloved soul food recipes, like salmon croquettes, smothered pork chops, all of the, uh, while placing the story in the tumultuous civil rights era. Now, in making this presentation, I drew upon a number of sources to tell as complete a story as I could within the time given, the time limitation. However, I want to reference two of the sources that guided my research. One of the books is In the Shadow of Slavery, African Botanical Legacy in the African World by Judith A. Carey Carn, excuse me, and Richard Nicholas Rosenbaum. Uh, and so this is one of the books. It was an excellent book. It really gave me a lot of information on the African a second book is called High on the Hall, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America by Jessica B. Harris. Uh, now, it's interesting, too, that the term high on the hall may be familiar to a number of people. I was looking up to the etymology of the phrase, decide where it came from, and the references I saw said that the first time it was published was like the 1920s, 1940s, etc. But it's interesting that Ms. Harris has given us another now, I can say this, and many of you can probably say this too. I have heard the term from my youth. Uh, and so it's not an unfamiliar term, high on the hall. Now, this is what she said in her book about that particular expression. I'll read it to you. Oh, master killed about 40 or 50 hogs every year. He had John to help him. When he was ready to pay him off, he said, John, here's your pig head and pig feet and pig ears. John said, thank you, boss. And so John killed the hogs for about five years that way. That's what he got for his pay. Then John moved on back of the place and got himself three hogs. Old master didn't even know he had a hog. Next winter, at hog killing time, old master went down after John. Old master said, John. John comes to the door, yes, sir. Uh, old master said, be down to the house early in the morning, and I want to kill hogs. Be there about 5.30. John says, uh, well, old master, what, what, what you paying? Well, I'm paying you like I always did. I'll give you the head and all the ears and all the pig feet and all, all the tails. John said, well, old master, I can't because I'm eating higher on the hog than now, uh, than, than, than that now. I've got three hogs of my own, and I eat spare ribs, backbones, pork chops, middling hands, and every, everything else. I eat high on the hog now. And of course, that term, that expression, again, uh, has a very, very long tradition, and it's still talked about today. Well, this has just been a kind of a cursory introduction 
to African foods, soul foods, uh, and how they influence and continue to influence, again, the uh, traditions of the South, food traditions of the South. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, uh, and that, again, if you'd like to learn more about it, one book, again, is In the Shadow of Slavery, African Botanical Legacy in the, African, in the Atlantic World, and High on the Hull, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America by Jessica B. Harris. Thank you very much.